Hello, I'm Dean Kavanagh and welcome to this very special edition of The Forum here on 107.5 Switch Radio. Between the 22nd and the 25th of May, over 350 million EU citizens will have the opportunity to elect 751 members of the European Parliament. In almost every European election, turnout has been decreasing rapidly and with the economic crisis looming large and immigration still a hot button topic, many voters are expected to abstain or endorse anti-EU parties. So what does this mean for the future of the European project? In this special European election debate, we'll be asking representatives from the parties standing in the West Midlands region to discuss the issues that will be at the centre of this election. We asked our listeners to send in questions covering a range of topics, including the economy, jobs, the environment, immigration, foreign affairs and European democracy. Don't forget, you can join in the conversation on Twitter by tweeting at switch underscore radio or email the show at forum at switchradio.co.uk. And anybody wants more information about the election and how the proportional representation system works, you can go to our website, switchradio.co.uk. So we're joined today by Daniel Dalton, the former chairman of Coventry University Conservatives and third on the Conservative Party's regional list, Will Duckworth, the West Midlands lead candidate and deputy leader of the Green Party, Derek Hillin, local businessman and lead candidate for the English Democrats, for the Liberal Democrats, we are joined by Phil Bennion MEP, former Litchfield councillor and current MEP, Mike Trust MEP, former deputy leader of the UK Independence Party and now lead candidate for an independence from Europe. And last but by no means least, local activist and UKIP second list member, Jim Carver. It should be noted we also asked, we demand a referendum now. No to EU and the British National Party are also standing in the West Midlands and are invited to join the debate. We're unable to reach the Harmony Party who are also fielding a candidate. And before we begin, each candidate will have the opportunity to make a one minute statement outlining why voters should cast their vote for their party on the 22nd of May. And we will begin with Jim Carver for UKIP. What we face now is a clear decision on a direction that Britain takes with regards to its relationship with the European Union. UKIP is un- unequivocal in its stance that Britain must leave the European Union. We are the, the only mainstream political party who have the ability to shock the political establishment by voting on May the 22nd to we withdraw from the European Union. That party is UKIP. We have a broad message, a positive message, that after 41 years, Britain's membership of the European Union, which of course started off as a common market, hasn't worked out. We, we're looking to the future. We're looking to a wider global world. We wish to rekindle our links with the Commonwealth. And I, the short crux of my message is that inside the European Union, our future is as a clam. The world is our oyster. It's a big, wide world out there. It's ours for the taking. Okay. If you wish to support UKIP on May the 22nd, look for the UKIP pound logo near the bottom of the ballot paper. Thank you. Uh, Phil Bennion. Uh, Yes, the Liberal Democrats are the uh, party of in. We are unequivocally for staying inside the uh, European Union and particularly inside the single market, which is vital for British jobs, exports and inward investment, which brings lots of lots more jobs in, in particularly into the West Midlands here. Uh, We are a party that's liberal both socially and economically. Uh, We're also a party that has pushed forward and will continue to push forward the green agenda. Uh, Our our economic policies uh, are pro-small business rather than large corporations and we want to see a uh, a rethink to a lot of European laws uh, through the refit process which will make all European laws eventually more fit for small businesses um, we want to see a special consideration for small and medium-sized enterprises uh, to, because they're, they're the engines of growth. They're the engines of growth in the European Union and in the British economy um, as well. So w- that's... Sorry, I've been cut off. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's an indication we're heading yeah. towards a minute. Uh, Will Duckworth. Hi, I'm Will Duckworth of the Green Party. We are in favour of a lot of things and against very few. We want to renationalise the railways. We want to bring energy distribution and water distribution back into public hands. We want a living wage for everyone in this country who works, not corporate welfare allowing big companies to pay people less than they can live on. We want to work for the people and for the common good. We are in favour of being in the EU, but we trust the electorate. We believe as a democratic party that we should have a referendum and that when people understand the implications, they will want to stay in. In these elections, we're almost certain to have two UKIP, two Labour and two Conservatives. The only decision we ne- you need to make is who's going to be the seventh seat. We've calculated that the 
Green Party needs just 4% of the electorate to, to vote Green to make sure I become your seventh MEP. OK, thank you. And Dan Dolan? Only the Conservative Party can deliver change in Europe. Only the Conservative Party have a plan to deliver that change. We propose reform of the European institutions, renegotiation of Britain's relationship with the European Union and bringing powers back to Westminster and an in-out referendum in 2017. It is only the Conservative Party that is offering this referendum and can deliver that referendum. We have a track record of delivering in Europe. We got us out of the Euro bailout fund that Labour shamelessly signed us up to after they'd lost the last general election. We vetoed an EU treaty and we've got a reduction in the EU budget. No one believed that these things could be done. We did all of them. We have a plan for change. And if you vote Conservative, we will put that plan into action. OK, uh, Derek Hillen. Um, I am the lead candidate for the English Democrats and the English Democrats uh, are offering to the people um, of the West Midlands a, a unique uh, opportunity to vote for independence for England. Um, what does that mean? It means that we are in favour of coming out of the EU. Um, the uh, people of the United Kingdom voted to join a common market uh, 40 odd years ago. They never voted to join a European super state, um, which increasingly we're giving away um, democratic powers to Europe and we're opposed to that. Um, so we, we, the English Democrats want a referendum to come out of Europe, but we also want a referendum for England to come out of its other union. We do not believe any longer that it's of England's interest to stay within the United Kingdom. We want uh, um, all the, the existing political parties um, have refused to give the people of England an opportunity to have their say on uh, independence. Scotland has a vote later this year on whether they want independence and it's complete hypocrisy and double standards on the part of the others to not offer the people of England the same. We should, that's what the English Democrats are offering. We're offering the people of England a chance to vote for independence. OK. And Mike Natras. I am one of your current MEPs and the voice of Euroscepticism in the West Midlands since the 1994 Dudley by-election. We're at the top of your ballot paper and a vote for an independence from Europe is a vote to leave the EU. We're against membership on many, many different reasons, but mainly because Westminster should be the authority dealing with law and regulations in the UK. Edward Heath lied to us in the 1970s and he told us that we wouldn't lose sovereignty, that the common market as it was then was about trade. Now we have President Barroso in the Parliament actually saying this is the new European empire into which you have pooled your sovereignty. So it's obvious it is the United States of Europe. Britain should get out because the only way forward is for our country to trade with the world, not just Europe, and to deal with its own legal systems. We differ from other Eurosceptic parties because we don't believe in privatisation. In fact, we're very angry at the situation now being proposed in the health service because we don't believe that private uh, business should interfere at all with the National Health Service, although we're not against private hospitals or private medicine. I would expect you to vote for my party, which is top of the ballot paper, ballot paper on the 22nd of May. Thank you. OK, thanks for the candidates. So we'll move on to the very first question that we've had in. Um, it's about the evolution of the EU, um, following on, I guess, from a lot of the comments that you've made. Uh, so the question is, the European Union has evolved from trading partnership to a commission and a parliament making laws that our country has to abide by. Has the EU overstepped its mark? And should we now have a say about whether we want to be in or out? Um, we'll give this first to Mike. Well, the European Union has overstepped its mark. It's become what is what amounts to a lie because it was about trade and it's now about domination uh, politically. And all our laws and regulations are emanating now from Europe whereas it should happen from Westminster. So the clear answer is that we don't need the European Union, who are always declaring one size fits all, and we have to deal with regulations in this country that don't suit our economy and don't suit our geography. They are, they're stealing our agreements worldwide. Our bilateral agreements with Commonwealth countries, for example, have now been taken over by the EU, and we have to obey their conditions rather than dealing direct with overseas traders. 
So I'd like to, to bring Will on this because as a party that sort of um, believes that the, the, the public have the right idea, that there's no sort of clear side, I guess. What's your view on this? Do you think the EU's evolved too far? Has it overstepped its mark and its remit? Uh, I think the EU has evolved greatly and will continue to evolve. It's bound to. And there are lots of decisions that need to be made more locally than Europe. And we believe in the right level of government to make the right decisions. So some things need to be decided at council level. Some need to be decided more locally than that even. Some need to be decided in Westminster. But there are some things like regulations on animal welfare and pollution that need to actually be decided worldwide. And unless you're in something like Europe, one of the big players, you're really going to fight that. And at the moment, most of the things that actually affect our lives are decided more by big businesses than any government. And if we're going to fight the tyranny of big businesses, we need to be part of an evolving and growing Europe to make sure that that happens. Mm. I guess, actually, it's quite a big um, election point for, for UKIP. So what's your thoughts on this, Jim? Well, getting back to the question, yes, of course we need a referendum. Um, we're not going to get a referendum. Um, during Over the, the past two general elections... Well, the, the, oh. questions, the, the question, that we go back to the original question, it's more about has the EU overstepped its mark? Oh, it, cer it certainly has, but, but we knew from the word go that it had overstepped its mark. Um, you know, there was clear indication from, from the beginning of the European project, actually from the very moment before we... we physically join the common market which was caused my mother voted for common market she didn't vote for political union um prime minister at the time mr heath our foreign secretary was a conservative former um prime minister called alec douglas hume and the very first um aid memoir which was sent from georges pompidou who was the french premier at the time uh discussed uh, you know the, the title of which was economic and monetary union by 1980 uh when uh alec douglas hume challenged ted heath on that he was he was um he was said well the house won't like this said talking about the house of commons and he replied well that's what it's all about alec that's what it's all about and it seems to me that since that time our political classes have consistently led us further and further into the european union and um, we have a situation now where you know we have to make this decision and i actually find myself agreeing with a liberal democrat phil would be surprised to hear and i find myself agreeing with the late roy jenkins former president of the european commission he said there are now two clear and consistent positions with regards to britain's membership of the european union all in or all out. And no matter what Mr Cameron and his Conservatives or Mr Miliband may argue, um, we cannot be in Europe and not run by Europe. We cannot be in a situation where we seek to repatriate powers. That's not on the table. Angela Merkel has, has confirmed that. Uh, President Barroso has confirmed that. Vice President Red Reading has, has confirmed that. And we have a situation now where if we wish to... If we wish to for example, Mr Cameron talks about getting back our fishing grounds. He can't do it because the Spanish and French are going to do it. So we have to actually say, let's let's have an amicable trade agreement with the European Union, but let's make our place in the wider world. Hmm. So I've seen numbers floated around. Um, UKIP saying 75% of all laws are made in Brussels. And also Nick Clegg uh, saying 5%. Mm -hmm. Is this, and I'll bring this up to Phil, is this a numbers game? Are we sort of <clears throat> missing the point by well, saying, you know, 75% here, 5% there? Well, well, you can't w sort of weigh laws in that numerical sense. They're not, uh, they're, they're not, they're not uh, all, um, they, they don't, they're, they're not comparable with each other. But, so uh, there, there is no single figure that you can come down on. It, it, isn't, a, it isn't a sensible question to ask. Uh, I would guess that it's somewhere between 5% and 75%. But, uh... I guess this is the point. That <laughs> the point that I'm making, though, is, uh, is, is, is looking at it in numbers, are, are we missing a trick? Well, we, you, we, just, we... you can't look at it in numbers because yeah. you can get a, a tiny little change in a regulation or you can get a sweeping law. Do they both count as one? Uh, they obviously do on, if you actually count them up in one way, and you, they don't if you count them up in another way. I think this is a, uh, a, a silly, a silly argument. But uh, if you actually look at what the um, what the independent assessments of this is, it's certainly at the lower end of that scale rather than at the higher end of that scale. I mean, pretty well everything we do in education and health, uh, public services that we have here, uh, the, the services run by councils, all of this is uh, all of this is the legislation for all of this is 
is at UK level. Yeah. Uh, there are only certain areas where we have uh, European law. But can I go back to the question that we had in the first place about the... Uh, about, Has it overstepped its mark? Uh, have it, have, well, of course, uh, individual commissioners try to overstep the mark. Sometimes the Parliament passes a, an own initiative report, which if, it, if enacted, it would overstep the mark. But everything that the... European Union agrees to, the Council has agreed to, that's the Member States. The Member States have agreed to everything that we've got now. Now, I'm not keen at all on much of the social chapter, and I think that a lot of, I mean, uh, a, a lot of working hours uh, can be set, not even, at, why do we even have to set them at UK level? Um, I mean, we, we would think that uh, it must, something might be more appropriate to be set uh, even by Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland if they wanted to do something differently. Yeah. Uh, so there are certain areas where I think we should roll back, but the, the government has just run its own balance of competencies review. Um, this And I have taken part in this balance of competencies review, and the overall outcome of this is that largely, largely, the powers that are at a European level are appropriate. Uh, and that's ex that's what the the government has, the, the government is, that is our coalition government has actually come up with this view that the, so the powers are largely possible. largely appropriate. I would have I mean the working time directive is something that I would I would bring back, but okay. uh, not much else. Okay. Well, it's all very well um, Phil talking about the council of ministers, but Britain only has eight percent of the votes on the council of ministers, and when. It records began in 1996. We've had uh, two British governments of different political colours um, arguing the British case in Europe. Of the 55 times that we have made made a formal British government made a formal objection, they have been overruled all 55 times. And I think actually, if we're talking numbers with regards to the the actual number of, of legislation, the percentage coming over from Brussels, let's not act, let's actually look at the question that the German Fe the Bundestag was asked through the German Federal Court. An official investigation was carried out, an independent investigation by the German Federal Court, which indicated that actually somewhere around 83% of the laws that govern Germany emanate in some sort of form of a directive or legislation from Brussels. OK, so I want to bring some other people in on this. Um, Dan Dull? Yeah, I mean, what you're seeing here is the argument between 100% in or 100% out. And that's completely not the way to look at the European issue. We're already not 100% in the EU. We're not in the euro. We're not in Schengen. We're not in much of the justice and the home affairs stuff. So it's never a question of 100% in or 100% out. And this is why the Conservatives are proposing renegotiation. Because going back to your original uh, question, yes, we've given up far too much power to Brussels. We've got to start bringing that power back. And that's what the Conservative Party are proposing. No other party can deliver it. Only the Conservative Party can deliver it. OK. Derek? Um, I think the EU has overstepped its mark. I mean, we had the ridiculous situation a few years ago where they tried to tell us um, uh, how our bananas should look, whether they should be uh, straight or they could be curved. Um, so we get a ridiculous um, time wasted on, on such uh, petty matters as that. Um, and and my, our argument is, wh why should we send all this money to Brussels for them to send some of it back, but uh, only some of it, and they tell us how to spend it? Um, it's costing us something in the region of £55 million pounds a day to, uh, for, for EU membership. Um, some of that comes back, but as I said, there's, there's strings attached to it. And as well, what nobody else has brought out is that the EU accounts have not been actually formally agreed for about the last 10 to 12 years. Yeah. So we actually don't know whether these people are spending the money we send them in, in a propitious way. Um, definitely, I, I think the, the question is that we must come out. I think the whole system is, uh, is, is rotten and that what we need is democracy at a national level. That means a, uh, a parliament for England. In fact, it's 19 years. The auditors have thrown out the accounts for 19 years. Uh, so we're, we're joined today uh, by Sean Simon, the former Labour Birmingham Erdington MP from 2001 to 2010 and second on the party's regional list. So the question is, has the EU evolved from its training partnership and overstepped the mark somewhat as to what it can and can't do? Um, well, yeah, it, of course it's evolved. Um, it's been a long time. And yes, it started out as a trading Partner, partnership purely as a trading body um, and over the years that's become uh, more and more uh, sophisticated and it's gone deeper and deeper and the bigger and stronger that the single market gets then inevitably the more rules and regulations you have 
around the market, just like you have uh, in in our own domestic markets, just like you have in any orderly markets in the world. Markets don't work completely unfettered. Uh, you need rules and regulations to make sure that consumers get a fair deal and that workers get a fair deal and that uh, th that it all adds up and makes sense. And that's what happens at the European level. But th the important thing, though, is not whether is not how well the European Union works because that's not what this election is about. If 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 people don't like the EU, if they either don't think we should be in it, or they think we should have a referendum on it, and that's a really important thing to them then in next year's general election, they should vote for a national government that reflects those views because those are matters for the national government. It's only the national government that can give us a referendum on the EU. It's only the national government that can take us out. It's only the national government that, re that can renegotiate uh, our position inside the European Union. If that's what matters to you, then at next year's general election, use your, use your vote in that way. This European election... You've got no opportunity to influence any of those things. That's not what it's about. This is a parliament that already exists. It already legislates. This is about the people that we send to the parliament, as it is now, to legislate next year and the year after and the year after that directly on things that affect all of our lives here in Castlevale and in Birmingham uh, and, and across the region. Uh, that's what this election is about. Who do you want to send there? Whose values most closely represent your values? Um, it's not about the EU. It's about Birmingham and Castle Vale and the West Midlands and your life. The question, I mean, I, 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 perhaps to defend the question asker, um, if you're asking them to vote on a party that's active in Europe, I think it matters to them what the institution is and how it works. Um, but anyway, I think Mike wants to come in on this. I just want to say that Sean has pointed out that this is a European election. I would like to point out that general elections, when the Eurosceptic voice is heard, it is always told to shut up because it's not a European election. And so it appears that we can't speak then about the European Union at European Union elections, neither can we deal with it at a general election. This is outrageous. Well, I mean, I've got to be allowed to answer that. I I never tell anybody to shut up in a general election. I think uh, general, uh, no election should people be telling uh, voters to shut up. Elections are times uh, f for listening to voters. But like, let, me just Ooh, finish, let, me just, let me just finish the point, Mike. Um, the, it's not true at all that the general election isn't the time for the Eurosceptic voice to be heard. The general election is absolutely the time for the Eurosceptic voice to be heard. And if the Eurosceptic thoughts and feelings are the most important thing to you in the general election, that's how you should cast your vote. That is the opportunity to change these things. A referendum, in-out, reform, you can influence all of those in a general election. You can't influence any of those at this election. This is about who represents you in the institution that exists now that is spending our money now, that is making laws that affect us now, next year, the okay. year after. If you want to reform it, you need to use, the, use your general election vote to get reform. I think we, we can move on to this point because we'll probably be here all day. So the next question we had in is, are politicians worried about the result of a referendum on membership of the EU? We'll start with Dan. No, we're not worried at all. I mean, we think the most important thing is that British people have a choice to decide what our future with the European Union is. And actually... That's why it's a brave decision to, for the Prime Minister to come out and make it clear that he will not be Prime Minister if he hasn't got that referendum as part of the next uh, coalition agreement if there's not a majority Conservative government. It is vitally clear on this issue the British people have got to decide. And I repeat, the Conservatives are the only party that is prepared and in a position to offer that referendum. So if you want to leave the European Union, then at the moment the Conservatives are the only option to give you that referendum. OK. Uh, will? Um... It's absolutely true that the, this election won't decide whether we have a referendum or not. That is for the British government to decide, quite rightly so. And politicians of different shades are worried that, that we might have a referendum and stay in, so there's no point in them existing anymore. Um, I don't think it's something that politicians need to worry about. It's something that the stock markets will worry about. And it's certainly something that businesses need to worry about. That's what we need to look at and make sure that we are helping small businesses and med medium-sized businesses to prosper. Derek, uh, you worried about the result of a referendum on the membership of the EU? Um, 
No, we're not, because actually um, I, I think th th politicians are worried um, about a referendum. Um, and they're keeping quiet about it. And the referendum is the one taking place in September for Scottish independence. Because if the Scots do vote for independence, then actually all bets are off. Um, if Scotland does vote for independence, the United Kingdom will no longer cease to exist. And therefore, our whole relationship with Europe will then be called into question. So actually, the uh, there's, political there's... parties are worried about a referendum, but it's the referendum in Scotland, because that's going to have a, a more profound effect on our relationship with everybody than, um, than a supposedly uh, conservative guaranteed uh, referendum in 2017. I'd, I'd say that the rest of the UK would would still be a UK. I mean, less and less Wales and how, how can it Ireland. be United Kingdom when and, and uh, this, Great Britain will no longer exist? Great Britain Wales. is the union of England and Scotland, and if Scotland decides to break up Great Britain, then clearly the United Kingdom cannot exist as well. This this whole point has has not come across in any of the debates. All the political parties are trying to make out that it's no big deal whatever happens, but actually it is a big deal. The Great Britain will no longer exist if the Scots vote for independence. Yeah, but this is about semantics, surely, yeah, because. Yeah. Um, Europe England, Wales and Northern Ireland will okay. still be in a union. Yeah. Yeah. Now, whatever exactly. you call that, they'll still be in a union. They can't be in a union because okay. there's no precedent okay. for it. Gonna, Great Britain okay, will is, cease to exist is, if the Scots Europe, vote for independence. Great Britain is a geographical term for the, for the island. island surrounding England, Scotland and yes, Wales. An island. Yes. Right, so I'm going to pull this back in. Um, <laughs> the question is, are politicians worried about the result of the referendum? Answer of the English Democrats, obviously no. Um, I'll move on to Phil. Uh, well, I'm not worried about the uh, referendum itself, um, but I am worried that the, um, the, pr the prospectus we're voting on is clear. And this is where I, th I, have, I differ from uh, the Conservatives in that I don't think we can have a clear prospectus by 2017. Uh, Dan has said that uh, there are a lot that, that it isn't all in or all out. He's absolutely right because we're not in the euro, and as he said, we're not in Schengen. Uh, there's uh, 16 opt-outs of the working time directive, uh, and this idea of variable geometry has become more of a reality as the European Union has grown. And if we get even more me new member states coming in, we'll have to face that again. So what we what we actually need to vote on. It is a reform for all, not just a special deal for the United Kingdom. Uh, in other words, other member states will have exactly the same rights to not participate in certain uh, aspects of Europe. Um, and I think that is the way we'll inevitably have to go. Uh, now, that will need a new treaty. And I think that that will probably take till 2020 rather than 2017. And that would be the right time to have the referendum. And my view is that it should be it should follow uh, the United Kingdom drawing up the draft legislation uh, to to depart, if you, if you like, so that we knew exactly what we were voting for and what the outcomes would be. Because there is an I'll, I'll, I'll bring Jim on, on this. There is an argument. Some people are saying that uh, with an EU referendum, it's important that people know the facts. And I mean, this is longer term. Right. But. Um, as well as, as, as whether you're worried about a result on the referendum, do you think people know enough about the EU to be informed to make that choice? I, I think they, they know increasingly more because of the mandate by UKIP MEPs over the last three European parliaments. Let's be clear, there has been this, I won't call it a conspiracy of silence, but uh, shall we say our, uh, our other three main political parties haven't been so, so have been quite backward in coming forward as actually explaining uh, how much control does emanate in the form of the uh, European institutions. But dealing with the question itself, um, let's get back to what our Prime Minister says. You know, Carl Sign Dave gave us his Carl Sign guarantee there would be a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty before before he came into power. Um, we, have, we have a situation now where if we look at the mandate of Mr Cameron, he's already indicated when we have a referendum, he believes in Britain's membership of the European Union. Dan, he's already said it. He's already said, I will campaign for the British argument to remain in the European Union. And let's look at the democratic m model that the European institutions have already created. We've had referendums on various, various treaties in the past, in um, Denmark, in Proud Islands, in France, 
and in the Netherlands. And when each of those sovereign, so-called sovereign nations have voted uh, no and voted against the wishes of the European Union and said, oh, oh hang on, chaps, let's go back and ask, ask the question again. Yeah. Um, and the biggest point of all, which nobody will talk about except UKIP, is that the, the Lisbon Treaty, which was, of course was initially called the European Union Constitution, which failed because of those no votes in those referendums, it's been rebranded. The Lisbon Treaty is now a self-amending treaty. So I question when and if we would ever get a referendum anyway. Done. Let me just make it clear on, the, on that Lisbon Treaty. What David Cameron promised was that if that treaty was not enforced before the Conservatives came to power in, after the general election, there would be a referendum. But Gordon Brown, a year before the general election, scuttled off to Lisbon, quietly signed the treaty. By the time the general election came, that treaty was already in force. It was not in our manifesto for the general election to have a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty because the treaty was already in force. And what David Cameron made very clear at the time is that we would not let it lie there, and we haven't let it lie there. There is now a uh, referendum lock in Parliament, so there can be no more powers given to Europe without a referendum. And it's clear, it's a manifesto promise that we will have an in-out referendum in 2017. So it's a self-amending treaty, Lisbon. We'll move on now, let some other people get in on this. Um, worried about that resort on a referendum, Mike? Well, first, first of all, our uh, constitution doesn't uh, actually need a referendum. It should be up to MPs to decide how we should trade with other parties in the world and it should be their decision. But they don't have the backbone, apparently, to do that. So they have to have confidence by asking the British people whether or not they think that we should be trading and be taken over by the European uh, Union. Now, when that vote takes place, obviously an independence from Europe, my party will be definitely campaigning to come out. And that's as much as I have to say about it. I feel very sorry that MPs don't have the backbone to stand up and say, I believe we should leave and I'm voting for that. And there won't be a majority of them by the look of the way they're making funny noises at the moment. So finally, just like to bring in uh, Sean on this. Um, I assume that Mike will be happy to uh, credit at least the Labour MPs with having the backbone that the Tory MPs don't have. Um, the Labour position is quite clear. We think we should stay in. Uh, and it's also quite clear uh, that we don't think that uh, a referendum, if nothing changes, is the, is the priority for the country. So, you know, we, we're quite clear. We, we stay in and... It's a matter for Parliament to legislate. Um, however, directly to answer the question, uh, is it worrying? Um, yeah, I'm worried. Uh, I'm, I'm worried at the idea that we have a referendum. Uh, it's a massive distraction for a country which is still uh, struggling to crawl out of an economic crisis. There's still millions of people unemployed. There's still a catastrophic cost of living crisis. People can't make the bills add up at the end of the week still now after four years of Tory Lib Dem government. Um, the last thing that the last thing that the country needs, hard on the heels of a Scottish referendum, uh, is another referendum uh, <coughs> two years after that that puts the, the the investment and the business climate in the country uh, at risk and makes everything uncertain. Uh, it, it, it's crazy, and that's why the entire uh, British business community is ranged from the small to the large to the medium-sized business organisations against it. So yeah, that's worrying. And any politician who's not worried about the result of a referendum, uh, which if, it, if, the, if the result went no, would have a catastrophic effect on the United Kingdom, would have a terrible effect on our national wealth and on our way of life. And if you're not worried about that, I think you're very complacent. So, of course, it's worrying. Yeah, I'm worried. OK, so we'll move on from that. And this is quite an important topic, I think, for a lot of people. Um, in the modern world... Do you think three national borders help or hinder our economy and growth? Um, we'll start with Derek. I, I think we should have open borders on trade. I mean, people should be allowed to trade with who they like. Um, and in actual fact, I mean, I think that's one of the problems with the EU, that they are trying to control who we are trading with and on, on what uh, conditions. So I remember this coming up a couple of weeks ago, that there, there's now an embargo on... Uh, uh, sugar trade with um, one or two of the West Indian islands, um, and that's been brought in by the EU. So um, I am absolutely in favour of uh, free tr uh, the ability to free trade, and I, I think one of the problems with the the EU is that it's trying to control that. Um, England actually was built on the basis of uh, free trade with the rest of the world. 
Um, you, you could argue that um, you know England is one of the the world's oldest trading nations, and absolutely we 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 are in favour of that. Um, and it would be better, I think, if we had control of our own destiny, so that we could decide who and where we want to trade with. Um, absolutely not not at all daunted by um, uh, openness. Uh, that I, I think that's an exceedingly good idea. Our objection is to political control, not to um, not, not not to trade control. Mike, well, the question of open borders appears to me to be about Europe itself and the European Union and the free the free movement of people. And I'm against that because at the moment, we just heard our friend from the Labour Party talking about unemployment in the UK. We have an oversupply of workers coming into the country and particularly at the unskilled end. So it jeopardises the unskilled UK workers and it jeopardises the school leavers because the foreign workers are taking over those aspects of the employment market. And I think if we're going to have people coming into the country, then adver advertising should take place in any particular area where they're needed to see if they are needed. If local people take up those spaces, there's no need to import people. And the people that come into the country should be on work permits with no guarantee that they can stay to an unlimited degree. So after the job's over and the work permit's expired, they should return back to their own countries. This is the only way to cure the unemployment problem that we have, and it will also stop unlimited uh, population coming into the country for criminal reasons and various other reasons that we really shouldn't be involved with. What we need is the kind of system that Australia has and other sensible countries that try to control who comes into the country. And that's the policy of an independence from Europe. OK. There is a report out at the minute, actually, um from Jonathan Wadsworth, who is a member of the Migration Advisory Committee, that suggests there's little evidence of overall adverse effects on immigration and wages uh, and employment for people born in the UK. And as it's hard to find evidence of much displacement of UK workers or lower wages, and they certainly don't receive preferential to housing. So in terms of how things are in the future, would you like to comment on that? Well, I would, because uh, you just mentioned housing. Why do you think we're having to build so many houses obviously our population isn't static it's increasing and we need to it's not just housing it's hospitals schools it's roads it's social services it's the whole facilities of local authorities they're trying to cope with an ever-increasing uh, population you say that they're not taking houses from uk citizens well i'm sorry that's not on the doorsteps what i'm hearing in and fact i had an employee the report who lived that, in, not me who, who <laughs> i had an employee who lived in a tower block who wanted wanted rehousing, she had children, she was Afro-Caribbean, and she complained to me saying, look, I've been here in this country because I was born here. I am of Af Afro-Caribbean stock, but I was born here. And these people from Eastern Europe are taking the houses down there, pointing out of the tower block she was in, and I'm on the waiting list. Where do I come? I've been down on this. Yeah, I mean, look, if you want free trade and you want open trade, as everyone said, you do need... Uh, free movement of people. You can't have open and free trade and be a global trading nation if you do not have free movement of people. That's not where the issue comes. Where the problem comes is when you have free movement of people between countries who economically are very, very different. And that's where the issue comes with some countries in Eastern Europe. Yes. If people are coming here to work, then that's beneficial for our society. They're offering things to our country, and it's good for everyone. If they're coming here because benefits that they can receive here are higher than they can get in a graduate-level job in the capital city in their own country, then there's an issue. And I think that's the key issue with immigration, and that's the issue we need to tackle. Well, uh, it's, it's obviously true, I think, that if we're going to have free trade across borders, we need free movement of people across borders. Is it a help or a hindrance? It's a huge help. There used to be people who were frightened of the people from the next village coming on and taking their jobs. It's just the same on a slightly bigger basis. Of course we we do it. Of course we need to move. It, there are as many people moving out to Europe as there are coming here. That's not true. All the That's figures true. all the figures show and tell me this isn't true that it migration into this country helps us economically. It is an absolute fact. And I would completely agree with the report. If and They've been talking about us needing more schools and services. Well, then employ people to build them and service them. 
it's obvious if you've got more people, you will need more work doing to help people. They bring a great deal into this country. And we are one of the very few parties who doesn't just want us to accept and tolerate migrants into this country. We appreciate them and we want to celebrate them here. If there's a problem with housing and with jobs, it's the failure of successive governments. It's not the people who are here needing jobs. It's not the lack of space, then. Uh, not very, the lack of space. Well, very, very quickly, if, Derek. If England, I, just, I just wanted to say quickly. that... Um, uh, Many, many new jobs now uh, are, are actually in warehousing. Um, we're, we're, we're not a country that seems to make anything anymore, but we certainly have uh, a large number of warehouses. And that's, no, yeah. that, well, that's, that's yeah. successive government policies that have brought that about. All, all I want to say is that it's well-known fact that uh, m uh, employment agencies are now only employing foreign workers. Um, th this is happening oh, up and down the country. Um, so uh, I, I think it's not true to say that we, 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 we could just have a free-for-all. We do need to have some control um, o over the, the, the movement of people uh, simply because um, you know we, we, there are abuses going on and I would back my cup um, that uh, you know large parts of, uh, of England are being concreted over because we can't control our own population. I, would you I just want to bring in just the, to get everyone else in first yeah. before we right. go into this. Um, Phil. Yes, well, um, I actually speak for our group uh, in the European Parliament on immigration. Um, I, I completely agree with what Dan said. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the fact that we have open borders has actually helped our, our businesses, and it actually means that uh, businesses are willing to invest here because they're not, they know that they're not going to be faced with uh, skill shortages. Uh, as a result of that, uh, we have actually got... A, that's one of the reasons why the UK economy has started to grow. However, we have to... We do have to make sure that our own benefit system does not pull in people simply to 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 claim benefits. And I've been working. I was working with the previous uh, immigration minister, Mark Harper, on this issue. I've been actually also working with uh, Commissioner Andor from the Commission, trying to uh, come to some agreement between the UK and the Commission on this. Uh, and they're not, they're not very far apart. There's a lot we can do to make sure that our benefit system is, is watertight and doesn't simply bring people in. The, the right to come here and work is, is, uh, is actually beneficial for Britain. Um, we also have to remember that there are, as Will said, we're, there, where there are 2.2 million British people living or working in other European Union countries. Roughly 2.3 million from other European countries living and working here. So I, I'm, I'm saying from the report, well, not the whole report, yeah. but some, some numbers from the <laughs> I report. I want to comment on the report. Um, because, um, the, the, I guess I've you know the one, I'm, yes. the one I'm going to yes. talk about. Um, of the roughly 1.8 million non-British EU citizens of working age in this country, around 90,000 or 5% claim an out-of-work benefit compared to 13% of Britons. Yes. Migrants yeah. from outside yes. the EU are much less likely to claim benefits. Yes. yes. Yeah, well, I actually wrote the foreword to, the, uh, to the, this. This comes from a, a conference we had at Birmingham University, which I chaired. Um, and it was a, a, a conference of academics. A lot of them were from uh, University College London, others from Warwick University, others, others from Birmingham University. We actually found out also that the, um, the immigrant population is actually running a budget surplus even now, whilst we have a 100 yeah. billion um, uh, budget deficit. This is because most of the immigrants here yes. that, are work that are working, they're usually single, they're usually young, uh, therefore they don't use much, uh, uh, they don't uh, draw down on the health service very much. As you've yeah. just pointed out, very, very few of them are actually on benefits. So they're actually a positive, uh, a positive contributors to our, our economy. And the other thing is that th this government, our coalition government, has created 400,000 new jobs in the last year through, through the private sector. And 380,000 of those have come off the unemployment register. So we can see that by being open, we're actually growing, but we're growing m more jobs than we are bringing in immigrants, which is actually benefiting the local population too. And I just want to finally just uh, counter uh, Derek, take. because uh, as far as saying that we don't produce anything or we don't make anything anymore, the West Midlands is, is responsible for almost the entirety of the growth in British exports. And it was, it was said last week, uh, there was a report came out last week that said that the, the United Kingdom is now the most competitive economy for manufacturing in Western Europe. 
Okay, we're going to Jim quickly on this question. Well, I'm, I'm delighted that, that Phil Phil uh, confirmed he chaired the meeting, which which was partly responsible for for drawing up of that report. So I, I like to look at reports that are more sort of politically neutral, and and this is the problem that one faces with regards to the question of, of the European Union from all different angles. You'll you'll hear one side, you won't hear the other side. Um, <laughs> as, uh, as far as I'm concerned... So that report, the, the figures I'm giving... <laughs> is, These were acad- the, it was the, an the academic figures, conference. It was not a political conference. Was I was just the, called the, in but to you were chair it. But as a Liberal Democrat, member of the European Parliament, you were called in the to chair figures, it. So I think we can get an idea of the, the background the of the people I'm, who, the who figures, wrote the report. The figures no, I'm giving here are from... It was written by from, academics. It was written by academics on peer-reviewed research. Peer-reviewed and, research. research. And, and Phil, Phil, did it? Did it do I was just asking... Do any of those, do any like of them hold as your... Men, do, do any I, of those academics I hold as your... OK, OK, I OK. I did not contribute any of the uh, academic work itself. It was done by university professors doing peer-reviewed research right. in universities. OK, so we were you're making a point on the... Yeah, perhaps <laughs> Phil, Phil Benning could confirm whether any of those academics actually hold the Jean Monnet chair well, the report in, in, is, a, in a specific university. Is this a report published by the Department of Work and Pensions? Because that's where this fi- these figures are from. <laughs> uh, no, I wasn't in anything. That, I think they've used some of the academic research. Okay. Uh, the DWP will look at what academic research is out there. Uh, what I chaired was a, a, a conference of professors who had been doing the research itself, uh, completely apolitical. Uh, these were academics from uh, respected universities in this country. And do, do any of them hold to Jean Monnet? I have you? absolutely no, no idea. idea. Okay, right. Okay. right. So, <laughs> very quickly, Jim. <laughs> yeah, um, of course, immigration is the big issue. Um, only last week, um, a very clear opinion poll gave 77% of the British uh, population are concerned at the open door immigration status with regards to um, people from within the 28 EU member states. And of course, as the European Union expands it, within time, that will, that will include an extra 100 million people from countries such as such as, uh, as Turkey and, and Albania. Um, and of course, what one has to look at, and, and one, one can't, and, I, and I will agree with Will on this, one, one can't um, dispute why people want to come and settle in this country to work because the minimum wage in the United Kingdom is six times higher than it is in some very poor Eastern European countries. Okay, but it's, but what we, we must do, but, but but what we must do, what we must do is look at the fact that when we cannot get away from that fact that we have. 20% youth unemployment in this country yeah. and the answer to that is not to increasingly bring in unskilled labour uh, from Eastern Europe and it's, it is our own eth- ethnic minority communities who suffer who suffer very significantly it's our own working class communities that suffer very significantly and the answer is not to bring in more unskilled cheap labour, all that does is keep wages low okay. so it must, so we'll, must be my turn now we'll, surely. we'll move on to this oh, point to, to, to Sean <laughs> um, first just to say, um, we've really got to stop saying things like we don't make things anymore in this country. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's not unusual. Are you, if you stop a hundred Brummies on the street and ask them about car manufacturing in Birmingham, they'll say, "Oh, we don't make car yeah. ma- manuf- we don't make cars anymore." And actually, not a few hundred yards from where we're yeah. sitting now, there's three thousand people employed making some of the most high-class, high-prestige, yeah. super, super premium, world-class yep. Jaguar Land Rover brands uh, in this historic site mm-hmm. where... Do you know that 52% of Spitfires in the Second World War were manufactured in that plant where they now make Jaguars and Land Rovers yeah. that they send all over the world? We have actually got a, an extraordinary market. heritage of manufacturing in the West Midlands that we should be immensely proud of and we should be talking up and, uh, and, we, and we should be... <coughs> We should be celebrating and not talking down. So, so don't say we don't make things because we bloody do. Yeah. Um, okay. On the on on the question of immigration, uh, it, it, like Jim said earlier, you believe it, you want to believe it goes round and round and round and round, and it has done for decades in this country, and it's only getting worse. The only thing I'm going to say is, just think, take yourself back to 2006 in this country, when a million poles very quickly came and settled in the UK and started working. Almost overnight, there was a million polls. And, and what happened? And the answer is, nothing happened. Uh, the economy, the economy rem- remained uh, buoyant, strong. Employment was... There was effectively full employment with a million polls coming in very quickly. Is it foreigners coming into this country that causes unemployment? No, of course it isn't. 
the reason people are frightened and worried about immigration as they are is because the economy, since the financial crash, has been all over the place. And since the Tories and the Lib Dems got into government, they've made it catastrophically worse in this country in the way that they haven't in the rest of Europe. That's why immigration is so worrying. That's why it, it seems like it can't be right, foreigners coming in. As Phil said earlier, there's 2.2 million British people living in the European, in the rest of the European Union. Shut down your borders, what happens? What happens? It, like, it's all very well thinking, oh, well, we'll kick all these people out, there'll be loads of jobs. Where's the jobs? Where's the jobs for the 2.2 million people who are going to have to come home in this fantasy right, future. There isn't a single party here that wants to kick anybody out, so I, I reject that particular remark. Okay, yeah, I'd just like to, I'd, it's got to be fair to get it down. Yeah, uh, sorry, on, on the economy, Britain is now the fastest growing economy in the developed world. So From a catastrophically low base. Well, against all for, of... For a government that's borrowed three times as much in the four years since late, since, since they took over from Labour than Labour borrowed in 13... We are significantly off point now. Um, so... <laughs> Could I come back at some ever, point on the lack of space? <laughs> ever so slightly rein it in somewhat to what is actually... When we had it in, seemed like quite a, a, a poignant question to end on. Um, what do you think are the most pressing concerns that are facing the next European Parliament? And we'll start with, with Jim. There are many, many concerns facing the next European Parliament. I, I feel that the largest concern facing the European Parliament will be how it responds. And it's quite clear from opinion polls across the continent that it's parties such as UKIP are going to fare very well in these elections. And it's how we're going to deal with this legislation being proposed by the Commission through the Council of Ministers. Because let's be clear about this. If the opinion polls and pundits are right, and I do get elected on May the 22nd to the European Parliament, I will be sitting in the only Parliament in the world that does not have the ability to initiate legislation. And that, to me, is a complete uh, democratic deficit. So the main issue of the next European Parliament will be addressing the huge democratic uh, deficit Jim, let's, created by... That, that, well, it European must be my turn to go second because I haven't oh, been second no, yet. Let's... No, 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 no. <laughs> Why not? Why not? There's no set order in which people go second. Well, how come no, I always I, go last? Because <laughs> I've, I've always put you last because you're sat there. <laughs> well, wh why don't we break it up and I'll go next? You can go after Will. Um, the most pressing <laughs> concerns are jobs. Unemployment underemployment and the poverty wages that people in this country and many other countries suffer from. Yep. Now, <laughs> I agree with that. Uh, the, the most pressing concern, it, it, it doesn't matter. I'm not interested in what are the concerns of the European Parliament. Uh, I'm, the, I'm interested. The voters are. I'm interested. No, no, they're not. I'm in, the voters are well, interested. They're asking questions. No, the, that. they are. What, what, if the question says... Believe me, they, I've they, talked to more voters in the last 12 months than you have. <laughs> And the voters are concerned about their jobs, their schools, European their issues. housing, their kids, their bills, their cost of living crisis. That's what people are concerned about. And if I'm elected to the... And immigration, yes. And if I'm elected to the European Parliament, those will be my concern. It's the concerns of people in the West Midlands. The European Parliament needs to reflect what matters to people in the West Midlands, not the other way around. So I agree with the Green and I agree with Jim that the democratic deficit is wrong. It's wrong that the European Parliament can't initiate legislation and I will join with him in a campaign for initiative powers for the European Parliament uh, because I know that that's what <coughs> UKIP is going to be doing next. Okay, well, just fol following on from that, the most important thing facing the European Parliament in the next few years is the trade deal with the US. That will address the issue that you're talking about with jobs. It will address the issue about free trade and everything else. We need to get that through, and we need to make sure the European Parliament gets that through. Now, on it won't be the, the European Commission. No, no, it won't. No, it won't. And the other point is, of both of you be very, very careful about wanting to give more powers to the European Parliament, because I guarantee you, you are talking right there about creating a European democracy, which means that even if 73... Turkey's voting for Christmas, Dan. We want, we want the whole thing out. No, no, you've just said you want more power to the European Parliament, which means actually no, we, we, going further into I'm the European Union and giving less power no, back to Britain. That. That's I exactly what you said. I did not say that. I was, I was teasing him, Dan. He didn't really mean that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give Derek a chance on this. Most pressing concerns for the next EU Parliament. Um, overwhelmingly, Europe is now dominated by the Eurozone countries. Um, and uh, obviously the UK is outside of that. Um, my, I, th I believe that the, the most pressing concern of the European uh, Parliament will be to how to sort out the monetary problems in the Eurozone 
And I think it, it, what we're going to face in the next few years, which none of the major political parties have raised, is the fact that the Eurozone must converge, that there will be greater political control of those countries inside the Eurozone, which means that the UK will be marginalised anyway, because the UK is not in the Eurozone. Um, and, and that will have a big effect Everybody's saying we need to stay in the EU because it will have a big effect on jobs and such like. But actually, what they're not, what they're not talking about is the fact that the Eurozone will uh, suffer political convergence over the next uh, few years. The, the UK will be marginalised by that. And, and what we will see is that the, the major political parties turning around the next five years saying we've got to join the Euro. If you really want to get control uh, of uh, uh, of your borders, if you want to get control of your lives, then we need to have an, uh, an independence. That means out of the EU and an independent England. Mike? The EU has uh, aggressively expanded over a number of years into now 28 different states and still wanting more Albania and so on and so on. One of their biggest issues and one of their main problems is now standing on the toes of the USSR, as was, in other words, Mother Russia. And the Russians are getting excited that all of these different countries surrounding them have been taken over by the EU and pressure is now on the Ukraine. That is going to be the next biggest problem because we're facing a horrible situation with Russia and I don't believe that the EU should be as expansionist as it is at the moment. Uh, but in my view, we shouldn't be in there, in the EU. We should get out and let them get on with it because it's nothing to do with us. We don't want to be dragged into a war with Russia and we don't want to be dragged into the legislation that they're cooking for us on a, on a weekly basis. It's Westminster that should actually govern Britain, not Brussels. OK, and finally, Phil. Uh, well, Dan, Derek and Mike have uh, raised three very, very important issues that are going to be challenges. TTIP, that's the trade uh, agreement with, the America, with, with America. Um, yes, making sure that the non-Euro members uh, are not swamped by the Eurozone. And thirdly, uh, we need to stand firm and stand together against uh, the threat uh, of Russia and increasing no. Russian power. And particularly, no, no. Uh, particularly... Uh, um, Russian command of so much of our energy resources, which they will use as a political tool. Uh, I, I would add that uh, we also need to get real about uh, international being internationally competitive. competitive. Uh, we have to face the challenges of globalisation and we have to face these challenges together. That means that we have to be serious about uh, the refit programme, which is looking through all European laws and making them more... Um, more suitable for smaller businesses, making uh, making our com uh, our economies more competitive, so that we can take on the challenge of uh, of international competition, and we have to do that through uh, upskilling our particularly our young people. Uh, this is the way to uh, bring them higher wages, not just simply saying let's give them a higher minimum wage. If we can upskill our young people uh, to address this high level of youth unemployment, uh, then they will be they will be ready to take on the challenge. That, that are coming their way and our economies will be robust and we'll be able to we'll, we'll be strong we'll be stronger together and we'll be strong in the world and we'll have influence in the world uh, if we address all of the challenges that have just been uh, have just been mentioned I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there thanks to our panel Sean Simon Dan Dalton Will Duckworth Derek Killen Phil Bednian MEP Mike Latras MEP and Jim Carver. Don't forget, if you want any more information about the upcoming European elections on the 22nd of May, you can find it on our website, switchradio.co.uk. We're back with our usual format on the 28th of May, so join us then.